Okay, 10.02 my time. I'm Ken Brown with the Toronto section. Bashad, who is our chair, unfortunately had a corporate meeting that he couldn't skip out of, but he'll, he'll be listening in as we go along. It will also be recorded to be put on our website for later to view at your leisure or to pass along with other folks. Also on the Toronto section website, there's a lot of our past presentations that you can go to, you know, with the focus being reducing tribological losses and failures. Just as a comment, in based on my experience, it's often That's extremely easy to save money just by applying better lubricants or leaving them in longer, things like that. It's You just have to know about it and go on doing it. So we're actually fortunate, very fortunate today to have as our, our presenter, Dr. John Dukowski. John, just for your information, has a bachelor in degree from Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. So we welcome him, certainly coming back. Um, now he's got a doctorate at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. From 1992 to 2004, he was principal science in the science and laboratory services department and vice president technology in the machinery and equipment division at Paul Corporation. That's actually when I first met John years ago when he was giving presentations at Paul and actually at the Toronto section as well too. Um, he then, 2005, he moved to Hydac Technology Corporation where he holds the position of a corporate director, R&D filtration. I'm going to let him talk a little bit on his projects as well, but we've invited him to talk today about online monitoring. He has a great deal of experience with that. Uh, Dr. Dukowski is also a fellow of the STLE and is a C has a certif CLS certification and also is oil analysis one and two. So with that, I leave it up to John and thank you very much. Just before John, you start, I'd like everybody to please mute themselves and turn off your videos. Um, if you want to ask a question, please use the chat. And there'll be time at the end where we can put on microphones as well, too. So everybody other than John, uh, please mute your, your microphones and stop your videos. Okay, thank you very much. And away we go, John. Okay, thank you very much for the great introduction, Ken. Hello and welcome to our presentation. I've had a, a great opportunity to visit the beautiful city of Toronto. So I decided to open up with a, with a, a picture of, a, of the night, night, night skyline of that beautiful city. I would like to welcome everybody to our presentation. Guten Tag und herzlich willkommen zu alle unsere Gäste von Deutschland auch äh, zu unserer zu unserem Vortrag auf äh, Überwachung Zustand Überwachung von Flüssigkeiten in Hydraulik und Schmiersysteme. Äh, bonjour, äh, bienvenue äh, pour unsere Präsentation äh, äh, pour, pour äh, äh, la surveillance der Kondition der Fluid in in System industriel. I dla moich wszystkich polskich przyjaciół witam i serdecznie pozdrawiam i witam Was na naszej prezentacji na temat monitorowania warunków i monitorowania stanu płynów i cieczy roboczych w systemach przemysłowych i hydraulicznych i smarnych. Ok, so now we, we go back to monolingual now. Um, one, of the, one of the things that uh, we just started talking about with Ken is that um, this is a cyclical issue there's, there's a great, uh, there, it, it comes and goes. The reason that it comes and goes is that the sensors get less and less expensive, more and more sophisticated, pretty much like the computer, uh, computer law, double the power every two years and, and half the cost. Um, uh, and then of course the uh, availability to acquire the signal and transmit the signal uh, over uh, large distances or even collecting the signal from various instruments on site has also become much easier. So, uh, but then unfortunately their drawbacks are experienced and people kind of then shy away from it. They get kind of burnt and then uh, let's say we have to wait about five to 10 years and the, and the, and the, and the theme come, the topic comes back again. And so we are at the position now where I think we are, let's say more than halfway there, but possibly not quite. And I would like to take you on an adventure of what we were able to see over the number of years that we were playing with this topic. Some of this material here dates back, like I said, all, all the way back to 2006. Some of it is brand new uh, and some of it falls in between. So there's a great number of different sensors available. Um, at HIDAC we have an advantage, and I don't want to sound commercial by any means, but at HIDAC we do have an advantage that we have our own electronics department, so we can construct and build these sensors in-house. Uh, and these include uh, things like water, uh, water relative humidity determination in oils, oil condition that includes also dielectric constant, conductivity, 
Um, at the beginning, we also had viscosity sensor head in it. Unfortunately, that didn't necessarily pan out. Particle counters, pressure sensors, flow sensors, temperature sensors, oil level sensors, and so on. And once we provide this distributed sensor array and install it all, over all the, all the operating equipment in, in a particular plant, then we can collect a signal on a single analyzer and examine it at a, at a later, more convenient time, or we can monitor it live. So once again, it, it even goes back to the definition of what is condition monitoring, um, and that is condition collection and interpretation. So it's not just collecting the data, the data but ability to interpret it. And I think this is also where a lot of uh, even commercial, very sophisticated labs fall short because they report to tables, but, and, and they have artificially set, or artificially, or let's say, limits set on, ba on the basis of some specifications, but they don't go beyond that, uh, they don't go beyond that um, simple or simplified method of analysis. In, in some cases, I have run into issues where uh, very intricate situations have occurred, but if you looked at them from the normal uh, maintenance perfect perspective and normal changes in the parameters of interest, say asset number or something, they were by no means extraordinary. And yet, component, system components, certain components have failed, and it required that uh, it required that additional analytical thinking is involved, not just procedures, but even thinking. So we have, you know, this is an old chart as well, dating back from the 1990s. Uh, way back way at Paul, we, we also grappled with this issue. We started to bring out some instruments, maintenance, reactive, obviously, if something breaks, fix it. Uh, but uh, obviously, more elegant way would be to prevent it from happening. But you can uh, then in, uh, institute something very simple like time-based uh, maintenance. So every three months, you change some component because you know that on average, it fails after three months. It's already better than reactive, uh, but it's not necessarily as elegant. And nevertheless, you have to replace the components still. Then we have now condition-based maintenance and predictive-based ma maintenance that are based on condition monitoring. So condition-based, if something gets out of whack, um, um, if something gets out of whack, it's incumbent upon you to fix it, but at the same time to know uh, how and why it got out of whack and, and how and why are you fixing it. And then predictive is uh, based on certain signals that the system or the fluid is giving you, you should be able to say, okay, you know, now this component is starting to act errat uh, erratically, erratically, and it's, it's time to address its condition, and also to investigate the root causes of why, why, it, uh, why this erratic behavior, what was the onset for, of this erratic behavior. So there's a number of different factors, and this is the, the whole trick of putting all these factors together, which is, which is, um, which is what affects the oil service life. Well, obviously, temperature, particulates, but not all kinds of particulates. For example, silica sand, in terms of chemical activity, is really innocuous. However, it does lead to abrasion, and in that case, it generates metallic particulate with very highly active, uh, very highly active surfaces. Uh, in which case, uh, in which case, it can lead to a, a chemical impact on the oil service life. And then we have truly chemical contaminants, which would be air and water, air by virtue of adiabatic compression, microdieseling, uh, which leads to uh, very, very highly elevated hotspot, uh, hot spots, temperature hotspots. Um, just to give you an example, uh, an adiabatic compression where the, where the heat is not being transferred to the outside or distributed throughout the system, uh, and an air bubble of about 5 micrometer or 10 micrometer is compressed to 1 micrometer and then forced to implode can lead to te temperatures as high as 6,000 degrees Kelvin. Uh, water, obviously, can uh, lead to hydrolysis, a hydrolytic breakdown of both additives and base stocks. And here, uh, it also is highly dependent on which additives are employed, which base stock is employed. Certain base stocks are much more prone to hydrolysis than others. Um, also, in terms of um, it affects the the, uh, the oil service life or component service life, in terms of uh, in terms of um, um, being free water or, or or being dissolved water. So the saturation limit here uh, plays a big role. And again, this has an impact on filter service life because if you now generate a lot of 
chemical, a lot of contaminants that derive from chemical breakdown, the filter service life is going to decrease very often quite dramatically. Um, Loss of leakage efficiency on the pumps also affects the, uh, the filter service life, temperature and particulates. So we can see that there is a complex interplay. And one of the, the big issues uh, or maybe drawbacks or with how um, online condition monitoring has been approached thus far is that it has been in isolation. So people do not tend to not to bring these factors together. So very often I heard that uh, my, my particle count is elevated, but my filter service life is not decreased. So either the filter is in bypass or the particle counter is reading, reading wrong. But if you take them in, in isolation, then you can obviously arrive at uh, erroneous conclusions and you get a misleading picture of what is happening within the system. So again, service life. Is dependent on, on um, oil service life depends on contaminants and let's say ingrained aging and degradation processes so since the oil is already heated is the, the oil is exposed to atmosphere particularly oxygen uh, if there are contaminants present then obviously this this uh, service life can or the degradation or this depletion of service life uh, can be can be further accelerated so there's uh, numerous methods exist for laboratory uh, oil conditioning uh, uh, monitoring, such as infrared spectroscopy. Somebody has forgot to turn off their mic. Somebody has to turn off their mic. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, some of uh, inf inf so for laboratory oil methods for oil conditioning include infrared spectroscopy, uh, titration for determination of the acid number, estimation of remaining antioxidant content such as rural particle counting, elemental analysis by atomic emission spectroscopy, and so on. And one can expand on this. One can also include. Uh, ultraviolet visible spectroscopy for analysis of color. So typically, the oils tend to tend to shift to the red, meaning they turn to they tend to acquire yellowish yellowishness and brown in, brownishness as they age. So we can see a shift in the ultraviolet uh, uh, visible spectrum absorption to the red. Um, it's not typically used. So people pe people typically fall back to something simpler like the ASDM color analysis. Uh, color analysis, which is simply visual assessment, but that tends to be a little bit subjective because not all of our eyes read the same way. So, you know, whether it's a color number five or color number three, it's sometimes difficult to say. But, and, and again, you know, since a lot of these methods were carried out at industrial facilities, not every power plant or not every steel mill wanted to invest in 27 instruments for all this rather sophistic, more sophisticated approach. Then the online methods for measurement of oil properties, like I mentioned before, or, and I will go over again, viscosity, electrical properties, dielectric constant, um, conductivity, relative humidity, infrared spectroscopy. In a very curious development long time ago at Pacific Northwest National Labs, they had a non-dispersive infrared spectrometer uh, where they basically used filters and they, and they uh, mounted the, the, these different filters onto a CD. Uh, and this CD would rotate into a particular position with a different filter, and you would be able to re to interrogate um, certain very well defined uh, regions of in of infrared spectrum. For example, to look at the carbonyl, the 1700 wave numbers would tell you whether there is, the oil is undergoing oxidation or not. And of course, particle counting, which was the, one of the earliest uh, online uh, instruments or analytical procedures adapted for online use. Few words, uh, not not too much, because I think it's everybody is uh, well aware of how this works. It's a light obscuration uh, method. Method you can use uh, different light sources. It could be white light, it could be laser, it could be light emitting diode. Uh, this light is then expanded uh, to cover a certain cylindrical area of the of the oil flow, and there is a photo detector on the other side. And the the um, decrease in the light intensity. Uh, detected by the photo de uh, photo detector is then is then calculated or or um, 
uh, is then calculated and and uh, and and translated into particle size and the number of these particles. So obviously, if there is a bigger decrease in the light intensity, it's a, it's a small decrease in the light intensity. It's a smaller particle. And if, but if the frequency of these uh, of these downward peaks is, is greater, then there's more of them. And then obviously, if there is a big decrease in the light intensity detected by the photodiode, then uh, then it means it's a larger particle. And typically what happens is there's fewer of those and on that basis, the particle counter can shuffle them into different bins uh, and determine what is the particle count for different particle sizes. The, the drawback of it is that, um, that the uh, light obscuration so, uh, is obviously going to be subject uh, or the, or the de decrease in the light intensity is going to be uh, result, is going to result from various mechanisms. So anything that either scatters, uh, refracts, reflects, uh, absorbs light is going to be counted as a particle because the particle counter just simply doesn't know. So any 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 water bubbles, any even silicone antifoamant bubbles, because silicone uh, antifoamants are typically pre um, prepared in fine dispersion within the oil, so they will get counted. The silicone droplets will get counted as particles. The air bubbles will get counted as particles. In one very curious uh, also experiment, I I, I took samples directly downstream of a, of a high pressure pump on a garbage truck and the count was 24 24 24 even though you couldn't see anything with your own eyes but you have to then remember that the last thing that we can see with our own eyes or the smallest particle count size that we can see with our own eyes is 40 micron so um so even though there was no bu there were no bubbles visible the particle counter counted the invisible bubbles and what you had to do is you had to let the the liquid sit on the desktop for let's say five to 10 minutes and the liquid would depressurize and then all the bubbles will show up. We're very much similar to when you bang a, a bottle of beer with another bottle of beer on the top. You know, there are a whole bunch of CO2 bubbles hidden within the beer, but they require a bit of a shock to come out to the surface and manifest themselves. So this is one of the issues. And one of the big big points that, I, you know, that, that, has, that has been dragging us down on this is that very much we are living in a in a kind of a we need the fast response fast answer and we need certainty and so whenever we get an uh, we we tend not to bring these factors together we then tend not to consider the background what we tend to focus on is the actual signal derived from the counter so here we go back to that conversation my particle counter is leading high but my filter membrane patch is clear and my filter service life is, has not been affected. Well, then therefore something else must be present and that needs to be investigated and resolved. Placement of the particle counter is also very important. Uh, if, you, if you place the particle counter directly downstream of the filter, obviously it's going to show you that the fluid is very clean if the filter is working. So this is a one way of, of, um, one way to making, of making sure that the filter element is doing its job. Another thing to do is is to put it on the return line so that you can actually see that before the filter element, what, what, ha what is happening before the filter element, how is the filter element being returned to the system, uh, or when it's being drawn out from the tank, what is being supplied to the filter elements and so on. So obviously in the ideal world, one would put these, if the, if the sensors were um, economical enough, to, uh, one would have a distributed sensor array of particle counters, and then through the system of checks and balances, one would be able to verify if the actual, the, the representation that one derives from the, from the overall system picture is correct or not. So here's a couple of things uh, that we, that comes from, from this uh, sort of an uh, analysis. And what we see here is that the blue line represents the torque on a bearing, uh, the, 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 the red and yellow represent the, the particle sizes, um, and the, the dark blue represents temperature, and the, uh, the, the, the signal from the, from the increasing torque uh, or the increasing, or the increasing um, uh, power draw, as it were, uh, on, this, on the shaft of the bearing is shown in black. And so you see here that when the particle counters initially go down, um, because the system is starting to 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 reduce the the the, the torque, 
and the system is stable. And again, you know, this is something that is in contrast to all the hospitals that we've been hearing lately. Uh, in our situation, it's good to see flat lines because it indicates that the patient is stable and the patient is not dead. So this is a, this is a good thing. And when we achieve this equilibrium, we filter out all the particles and the system is stable, and we can see that the particle count is, particle count is generally down. And then as we start to increase the work and the increasing the torque uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the shaft, and, the, and there is, a, there is a, a, the, there is, we're starting to induce damage on the bearings, the particle count signals uh, are, starting to, are starting to rise. So here we have a, a, a live interpretation, and this is, this is, a very, this is an elegant instrument, uh, elegant experiment, because we were able to, to short circuit this down to two hours. So we don't have to wait, which, we, which typically does happen in, in, under normal field operating conditions, that we may have to wait a year or six months. So here, since this is a test rig, uh, we can induce damage, if you will, um, and, and we can force the bearing to fail, and then we can see uh, what is the result uh, and how the bearing responds to the induced failure and how this induced failure manifests itself in the increase in particle counts. Another case was the, um, uh, what happens when the, when the system is being flushed out, as it were, when we're moving the boom around on crane boom hydraulics. So if we move the boom up and down, we, we swing it out, uh, we move it out, we can see what happens to the particle counts. Uh, and I carried out a very similar experiment on uh, on um, uh, on on C5s that came back from the Desert Storm uh, at an Air Force base in the U.S. And what they did is we we flushed the system first. Uh, we flushed the system out first with a hydraulic mule in steady state condition without exercising the tail or the flaps. So we essentially clean out, cleaned out all the pipework. And then we exercise the flaps and the tail, and we, we witness similar peaks in the particle counts uh, as a result of the, of the dirt being flushed out from the nooks and crannies of the hydraulic system. So again, this is very uh, instructive to carry out that we don't just install the instrumentation in a totally passive mode, but, but actually challenge the system and see how it responds, and uh, and and what effect it can demonstrate, what effect we can record on our on our uh, condition monitoring devices, and can we put the two and two together? It's very important to put the two and two together to see that it, the situation makes sense. So switching over now to to the water sensor um, again, uh, the difficulty here is the the. Um, the transfer of information or the correspondence of information between what we measure online and what we measure in the lab is not one-to-one. -one. Uh, and it's simply simpler to, uh, to measure relative humidity in a normal system, um, but unfortunately that does not tell us what is the actual content of water content in PPM. And since a lot of these specs are based on engineering requirements and engineering specs, people are used to the tables. And they are used to seeing certain tables written into the into uh, written, certain numbers written into the table, and they would like to see one-to-one -one correspondence. And so it's not it's not necessary it's not really instructive or or beneficial to say the relative humidity is forty percent because it doesn't really mean anything to anybody. Um, and moreover, the relative humidity is going to change with temperature, and that's even when the system is closed, not even when the system is open. When the system is open and the water evaporates, that makes it even worse. Uh, but when the system is closed and the relative humidity is going to change simply as a result of, of, the, of molecular motion, molecules move further apart from each other, so the number of water molecules per unit volume of the lubricant decreases, and hence the relative humidity goes down. But it does not tell us that we actually have removed or added water to the system, which can be misleading. If we have a, if, if we don't know if the water is ingressing into the system or egressing as a result of condensation or egressing from the system as a result of purifier functioning. So it's it's what we have carried out was we have carried out a systematic procedure in order to be able to convert the relative humidity to PPM. We cannot do it yet online. Um, we can generate tables and we can generate curves, and then we would have to carry out a, a computer-based um, calculation in order to determine that. But it is possible, uh, and, uh, and we, we have been doing it. And this is exactly what we learned. And this is something already that we learned. It's also very interesting because we, from this, we can immediately also see 
the rather dramatic differences among all the various oil types. So transformer oil being naphthenic based stock is typically very, very low. Um, it can tolerate water to very, very low extent. So its saturation point is very, very low. So what we see here is, for example, even at very high temperatures, it will be saturated with very small water amounts, let's say 100 ppm or so. Typical mineral oils, um, depending on the base stock and depending on the additive package, this, this uh, saturation level is going to go up. For typical mineral uh, hydraulic oils, this may be somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 to 300 ppm range. Polyolesters are already much more polar, so they will go up even higher. And, and phosphate esters, which are even more polar, will go even higher. So here's already the, the inherent difficulty with a general recommendation of maintain your relative humidity at 40% because that is safe. But well, 40% represents 40 ppm for an oil that is saturated at 100 ppm, and that's okay. But for a phosphate ester that is saturated at, um, at 5,000 ppm, 40% is 2,000 ppm. And most of the um, phosphate ester hydraulic system specs say that the maximum allowable limit is 2,000 specs, and those are the 2,000 ppm, and those are the generous ones. The, the more stringent ones call for 1,000. So we can see that the general recommendation of 40% doesn't hold. Okay? Another very interesting thing. Um, PAOs. Uh, PAOs would be somewhere around here because there's a synthetic and pure hydrocarbon, they obviously do not tolerate water very well. But PAOs are very often uh, admixed with up to 25 or even 30 percent of a polyolester uh, in order to facilitate additive solubility. And so they would actually lie somewhere here. So already by generating, generating a saturation curve and determining the saturation behavior of a given fluid can tell us something about the chemical makeup of the, of the fluid. And another most interesting example is, is polyalkylene glycols, which they exhibit actually the negative trend. And the reason is that they, they, they are prone to and subject to hydrogen bonding that occurs at, at low temperatures. So the water is bound to the backbone of the molecule and does not manifest as free water molecules or dissociated water molecules, not free as in, as in free water phase, but dissociated water molecules floating around the system. So they don't migrate into the sensor and the sensor misses them. As the temperature goes up, that hydrogen bond, which is a, a relatively weak bond, is broken and, the, and this water dissociates and these, mo these dissociated molecules are released. So it's less water, less additional water is then required to saturate the fluid. So the, the curve is actually going in a reverse, in a reverse direction. Very interesting. Now, switching over to instrument uh, monitoring, uh, this is a uh, differential pressure sensor, and, um, and we can monitor the differential pressure across the filter, filter element, which, which tells us a couple of different things. First of all, if we uh, look at the curve, the, the red curve versus the blue curve, or blue curve versus the red curve, one of the things that we can say is that um, ignoring what the dirt holding capacity on the bottom says, uh, let's just assume that it's dirt added. This basically says that there is a lot uh, more, a lot more dirt has been circulating in the system because the, this should be time actually that would be more representative if we're talking about uh, a, a normal operating system. So it requires less time, say 14 minutes, to plug the filter as opposed to 25 minutes because there's twice as much dirt floating within the system. Another thing is that this flat line here is indicative of the fact that the depth of the filter is being employed for particle deposition and particle holding, whereas the straight line indicates that the surface active mechanism is operative. So what we have here is cake, and between the caking effect. So what we can distinguish between these two situations is that if the sub system is subject to high level of hydrolysis and gel formation, or varnish or whatever, even though I hate that word because varnish doesn't really mean anything in 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 turbine lube oils, varnish is a different different animal compared to paper lubricating oils, but people still call it varnish. Basically, soft gelatinous materials, caking effect is operative, and therefore, actually, the filter service life is much shorter, and what we see is this, this straight line behavior. Um, in, in, in a normal, opera, no, normal operation, where the, the particular particulate is, is um, loading the depth of the filter first, we would see this flat line running for a long, long time. 
One of the problems with this predictive maintenance here is that we can never predict when this kink is going to occur for a number of reasons. We cannot predict when when the, the filter switches from this from one mechanism to the next because it's dependent that depends on the particle nature, particle distribution size, uh, content of the particle, the amount of the particle within the fluid, and so on. Um, and of course, it also one of the things that we cannot predict is a is a night or you know is the so-called Baba factor. Who adds something on the night shift that all of a sudden uh, we switch from the red curve to the blue curve? Oops, sorry. One of the most interesting anecdotes, and I have many of them, so but I don't want to go into all of them because I could probably talk for hours. Was the Jaws ride at the Universal Studios? Um, the the shark came up and never went back down. And the reason was that somebody has added diesel oil to to hydraulic oil to top it off on the night shift. Unfortunately, he was not told any better. And the additives in the diesel oil are typically overbased, so they are basic, whereas those in the hydraulic fluid are typically acidic. Acid-based reaction occurred, except organic acid-based reaction. A lot of gelatinous material formed immediately. The filters plugged instantaneously, as did the servo valves on jaws, and therefore the jaws got stuck. And so you can imagine the pressure that was upon us to solve this problem rapidly and as fast as possible because there was a huge lineup of people waiting to see the Jaws riot at the Universal Studios. And so a lot of quick and, and detective work was required. And this is, we employed then uh, obviously laboratory methods such as infrared and atomic emission to identify element, to, to, to carry out elemental analysis as well as molecular analysis and put the puzzle together. So one of the things that would be very, very nice is if we could, if we could provide a chemical sensor uh, and install it on the system so that we can monitor these changes live. And this is, this is something that we have constructed already in, uh, in the early to, to or I would say, mid to, mid to 2000s to early 2010s or 12s. This was the HIDAC lab, um, which consisted of four different components, the electric constant sensor, viscosity sensor, temperature sensor, and humidity sensor. Um, the idea was that dielectric constant should be able to tell us about the changes in the chemical environment, such as acidity, uh, such as, for example, incorrect fluid being topped off, uh, or fluids being topped off with incorrect fluids, because like I mentioned, the, the acid-base behavior, or possibly coolant, which, in, which would include water, and for this, the humidity sensor would kick in. Viscosity would, could change rapidly and we'd be able to monitor it by this quartz crystal microbalance sensor. And then obviously temperature because, because the viscosity and humidity are dependent on, as well as the dielectric constant, are, temp, are, are temperature dependent. So they had to be te compensated for temp temperature as well. Um, in order for the deposits not to form on the quartz crystal microbalance, it, it was necessary to, to make sure that the that the um, that this crystal is subject to constant scrubbing uh, by the by the fluid uh, flow. So what we have con we have constructed a computational fluid dynamic models and make made sure that the that the that the that the, that the surface of the of the crystal is constantly being scrubbed uh, by by the shear force um, and that the system had to, the system or the crystal had to be mounted in an upside down configuration in order to facilitate this through this this uh, flow through of the fluid through the through the system components. Um, the, the signal uh, was a was a four to twenty amp uh, four to twenty milliamp signal that consisted of various components and these could have been acquired with a digi uh, analog to digital converter and you know, immediately converted uh, online with an Excel, for example, or some other function or, or some other software to give us the, the relative values. So because the sensor really detected the, rel the changes, so the relative change, uh, except for temperature, uh, all the other values were uh, percent of change or uh, relative humidity was also absolute relative humidity, but the, the viscosity and dielectric constants were relative. So measurement range is minus 25 to 100, so essentially any industrial system, humidity 0 to 100%, relative change in viscosity 1 to 1,000 within that range, but we're talking about percent of change. And the reason was that one of the, one of the basic uh, specs for fluid acceptance for continued use is plus or minus change, plus or minus 10% change in fluid viscosity. So 10% minus means the, the fluid has been sheared, uh, that it no longer uh, 
possesses the, the appropriate load carrying capacity. On the other hand, increased by 10% means that the fluid has polymerized enough that uh, now it's it's going to uh, it's going to to uh, provide a, uh, too much of a resistance uh, to the system operating components. And the relative change in dielectric constant from the absolute value of 1.5 to 10. And uh, two free configurable outputs, switching outputs uh, and so on, so we could actually act upon uh, the signals that we received. So initial, initial evaluation of it, and again, admittedly, um, this was a, a prepared uh, laboratory fluid polyolester devoid of additives because we didn't want to deal with too many different things. Uh, and we were able to get, generate a relatively good and smooth calibration curve uh, for, the, uh, for the changes in the, in the kilohertz frequency changes in the quartz crystal microbalance crystal. So this was looked very, very promising and encouraging. And so we continued. And the idea was, uh, let's see what happens if we, um, if we compensate this to temperature um, we normalize it to 70 degrees, and we can see that there is going to be a change in this in this oscillating frequency. That means the fluid is increasing in in viscosity because the, there is a dampening effect on the quartz crystal microbalance. So this looked uh, equally very promising and very encouraging. Uh, the idea was to let's see if we can correlate it to standard laboratory procedure uh, like the ASTM 445, and indeed we were able to do it over a period of several days using this normalized value. Uh, and the black points were actually the laboratory ASTM D445 derived points. So unfortunately, what happened in practice is um, in practice, you do not have the luxury of dealing with a single component fluid uh, that tends to degrade, degrade under very well controlled laboratory conditions. So you have a whole bunch of other factors, air bubbles, all kinds of other debris, floating around. You have materials that, uh, regardless of the fact that you try to shear, or shear them off the, the quartz crystal microbalance, they still nevertheless form a deposit, so you have an additional dampening effect. And so unfortunately, long term, uh, we had to back away from, from, uh, from this approach. The next thing was to use the dielectric constant to monitor the acidity in the fluid. And here, this, we observed the same thing that in, as we cooked the fluid, there was a, a, a regular increase when we normalized the value. There was a regular increase uh, in the value normalized to 70 degrees C. So we actually were also quite hopeful that this could lead us, uh, lead us to be able to provide a total acid number measurement on site. And this is, this is the response in, in, in comparison with the, uh, with the total acid number D664 kilometric titration. And we looked at the normalized dielectric constant, and it looked promising. But again, the problem with both, the, both of these is that the acid number in, in D664 detects many other things in addition to, in addition to, the, to, to let's say, the acidity inherent uh, in the fluid. It also detects other species that, that came there from, as a result of uh, additive degradation and so on. So uh, again, the correlation under normal operating conditions or under real operating conditions fall, fell apart. So we're still searching. What did it look like when we tried to play around with it in reality? And so when we looked at the viscosity change, one of the things that we did notice is that, sure, um, um, viscosity change in terms of temperature when the temperature was dropping down, we did see there was a correlation, but you can see also that there was a bulk change in the, in the, in the, in the viscosity change in percent, uh, whereas it is not necessarily reflected in these temperature changes. Then we did see that once the sheared oil was replaced with fresh oil, okay, we observed a similar behavior and only marginal correlation with temperature, and sometimes none. So still, obviously, some work is required here. Um, we would have to investigate this more closely. We would have to look at other sensors, um, other possibilities. Uh, there are uh, so again, you know, this is something where we have to go back to the drawing board. Uh, one of the very important things, is, like I said before, is to tie all these things together, and most importantly, is to be able to send them somewhere, uh, because the um, because the thing is, we we don't want to. Uh, 
we don't want to have the maintenance people and we don't want to have ourselves run to the to the to the facility to actually take a look as to what is happening on site what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to steer the process or at least watch the process um, from from remote location so being able to tie all of this around into some sort of a sensor monitoring unit uh, into a GSM module and to be able to send this signal um, to your desktop is, is, is of great interest. And again, I think this is something that, that we're coming upon more and more um, realistically now um, in, in, with the devel development of the cloud systems and so on. So I think this is, this is around the corner um, and, and we will be able to tie all of these things together relatively soon. Okay, this is um, uh, this is one of those early early examples. This is the Haida Lab on a on a on a caterpillar engine driven compressor. And here's a and so here we are operating remotely in the true sense of the word. I was sitting in Pennsylvania and this is in Texas. Um, we did have the Haida Lab on it, and I was getting these signals regularly. And so my first question was, I called, I called the customer up and I said, why is it, and I don't know how well you can see it, but hopefully well enough, how is it that every morning the temperature of the compressor is going, oil in the compressor is going down from 80 to 40 degrees C at a relatively regular intervals? Are you shutting the compressor down? Because knowing that how big of the, the, the reservoir, oil, oil reservoir this compressor is, or on this engine is, it makes, it makes reasonable sense that if the compressor is down for two hours, the temperature would drop in this fashion. And, and the regularity with which this occurred suggested to me that, um, yes, they did it on a regular interval to cool the compressor down or what have you. And here was, a, you know, here was a, a, another interesting anecdote. It turns out that the compressor had other 16 different sensors on it, and our sensor was an, was an odd man out. And since all the other ones were already well established, the the, the people that provided the, the 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 data collection network, the 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 the, the, the real the signal gathering network, um, wanted did not want to disturb the other sensors. And so I, I don't know if you're familiar with email terminology, but the, the the way that the email used to be transmitted in the old days is with something called daemon. And Damon was uh, this this program that used to run around from all these different uh, run around uh, by, through all these different computers, collect all the emails, send them back to the server, and the server would send them out into the world and so on. And and this is exactly what they did here. They had a Damon running around collecting the signal from all these different sixteen sensors, and they had our sensor on a on a separate Damon. And what happened is. There was a handshake mismatch between these two between these two data collection circuit, but unfortunately, the um, the this mismatch this this handshake mismatch did not manifest itself as a blank, but it manifested itself as the decrease in this temperature. You know, so once the mystery was solved, we had that we had that issue fixed, and then we were able to to obtain um, a regularly uh, a regular and reliable data at normal normal data collection intervals. So again, you know, this is already something that you don't know whether you're dealing with reality or not if you're sitting 2,000 miles away from your data, from your distributed sensor array. This was a pulper in, in, in Quebec this time. Um, and one of the things that we were able to record and observe immediately here is that the heat exchanger has, has failed. Um, and and this, was a, this was here a very valuable information and real information this time. Because if you look at the normal temperature of 40, 46 degrees C at this bearing and 49 degrees C here downstream of the pump, downstream of a heat exchanger, you should, you should not be reading 45. But, but we were, and the signal um, is rightfully flagged red, uh, indicating that obviously the heat exchanger uh, has run into a problem. So here we were able to alert the customer and really provide them a, a, a real-time information that, yes, there is something wrong going on, and this sensor... It was actually, although obviously it was a, not a good thing for the customer to have to, to have occurred to, but it was a rewarding thing for us to, to see the sensor turn, turn from white to red as a, uh, as a result of this occurrence. 
Now let's uh, switch topic now for for yet another in, uh, in, uh, another side, and that is we are always searching for new and improved condition monitoring parameters um, that would tell us something about the fluids. And one of them that we have stumbled upon is conductivity, and the conductivity is um, is very very varied amongst different oil types, and it depends on again the oil base stock type, the additive content, and so on but it can tell us a lot about the oil type and uh, as well about the changes occurring within the fluid. This is not an online sensor, I want to emphasize. This is an offline sensor, but it's not, it's, we're working on, on, on uh, developing an online. Uh, the, the point here was to evaluate the viability and feasibility of using this new parameter for, for assessing the oil condition um, in a live system. And so we picked, uh, a, a really sort of a uh, you know a, a geek dream or a, or a scientist dream is to have a isolated test stand um, at, at an at a, on a customer side uh, that is really given to us uh, to play with and it does really nothing more than simply circulate the oil uh, all, it's over and over and over again through um, through two filters um, that were set up such that they would exhibit electrostatic uh, charging and discharging behavior because we wanted to induce oil degradation uh, and we wanted to investigate uh, what is happening with the oil upon upon uh, being it being subjected to regular electrostatic discharge so we had the oscilloscope on site uh, we had the tectronics high voltage head and we had our uh, statistic sensor mount, mounted into these two filters and we were able to acquire the signal this is what the signal looked like it's not dramatic by means, uh, by any means, when we, when you compare uh, typical electrostatic discharge signals, where, for example, in turbo lubricating systems, uh, we see hundreds of volts to to kilovolts. Um, here we see a regular signal of about minus 100 to minus minus 150 to minus 200 volts. Although we do see discharges, the sharp spikes here on the millisecond time scale are discharges, and they get down to about minus 300 volts. Very mild by other considerations, but nevertheless sufficient. And this is what happened. Um, this is what happened. Uh, we, this is a new oil after 800 hours, 1500 hours, and 2300 hours. So within a, approximately six months, and this is a temperature dependence of the conductivity signal, and we can see that it does did change quite dramatically. And what was another very encouraging uh, sign for us is that nothing else has changed. So uh, additive content and, uh, here has remained the same. E even zinc content plus or minus few ppm, and this is a zinc-free oil, has remained relatively the same. Um, the um, sulfur content has remained the same. It's a thiophosphate additive, uh, additized fluid, but obviously with some, um, with some na native sulfur present as well, because the ratio would not be 10 to 1 or 100 to 1, in fact. Uh, it would be somewhere more like 2 to 1. Um, one of the most encouraging things is that water has not changed. Yeah? So we're dealing with the same water content. So we cannot, we cannot ascribe these changes in conductivity to changes in the water content. And the acid number has remained the same. So the acid number would be detecting bulk changes in the fluid, whereas here what we're detecting is very, very advanced signs of oxidation. And this is, for, you know, for a scientist, a geek like me, this is a, uh, really an amazing thing to see that we can spot oil oxidation signs really this early. And if we plot them on, a, on an Arrhenius plot, uh, one of the very, very interesting things see, we see that is that the increase in, in let's say, in not necessarily in the slope too much, uh, but, but, um, but more, more in the intercept. And the slope is the energy of activation. And it stands to reason that the energy of activation should remain the same, because in reality, bulk of the fluid has not been affected. So if we're looking with hexadecane or something like this, a standard hydro, long hydrocarbon molecule, it would still, st still take the same amount of electron volts to oxidize it, whereas what the intercept is changing. And what is happening with the intercept is that this is the ion activity and the ion count. So we were making more ions, amazing as it may see in a com completely non-ionic system, but nevertheless you do have you require ions in order to have conductive changes in conductivity in order to have any conductivity at all. 
and the num number of them and activity, their activity is changing. So they're moving around more and they're becoming more and more active as there are more and more of them about. So this is a very, very promising result and we are definitely going to pursue this further. And again, you know, one of the rewards is I'm uh, also a, a photography geek. And so, so one of the rewards is that uh, on site, uh, one is able to take, um, and without too much self aggrandizing I would rather say that this is quite a beautiful picture. And also it's great to be able to work with dear friends of, dear friends of yours on site. Uh, this dear friend of mine, Johannes, Dr. Johannes Stout, and another dear friend of mine, Dr. Uh, Dr. Timo Lang, with whom we carried out all these experiments on site. And then, obviously, the fun part begins. We have to go back to the lab and uh, keep perfecting our technologies and keep perfecting our, uh, keep perfecting our understanding and approach to the, to the subject matter at hand. And I would like to thank you very much. Okay, thank you, John. I'd like to assess everybody. If you have any questions, please just enter it into the chat and we can read them off. Uh, we have one question here, John, I, I think you covered it, but there's a question of whether there's a water sensor that can be installed into a bearing if, if they could read it in PPM. And I, I think you addressed that from the point of view that you can't measure PPM, but you measure the relative humidity. But I think it would be a matter of them trying to decide if they do have a water concern, you know, whether it still might be useful. Do you want to comment on that at all, John? Sure. Um, I think I think knowing up content in PPM is still is still more is still more important and more critical I think it's it's it would be um, it would be it's we're not too far off from being able to provide an algorithm that con that converts this in line I, um, that converses on the fly uh, one of the concerns that has always been raised is that saturation content or saturation limits can change can change in the course of the oil service life as a result of additive degradation, oil oxidation, and and so on. Um, we have only had limited exposure to this, and in the, in the two cases that I've seen on a on a on a morgue oil application, uh, it it remained rock solid over a period of about three years. But obviously, this is something that um, uh, that we have to investigate further. Uh, if we're going to if we're going to go that way, because we want to provide uh, reliable uh, reliable data to our customers, no doubt. Okay, John. Just just as a comment, in case uh, they say they wanted to go up to ten thousand ppm, which is incredibly high, but if they just wanted to know if there's a leak, you would still pick that up with a relative humidity sensor, wouldn't you? If there was water ingress. Well, I mean, the ten thousand ppm again. You know, for a phosphate ester system, this would be ninety five percent or so. Uh, but um, depending on what temperature, um, the problem is that once you once you get over the saturation, uh, you get you get 100%, and you don't know more about if there is more water still coming in or not. So once you hit 100%, you're done. And the other thing that happens, unfortunately, is that the water sensor is very much like a like a camera or your eye. Um, once it, it's exposed to very very high water content. Um, it, the, the sensor maxes out at 100, and it's not that easy to bring it back down again. You have to, you have to make sure that the water that's migrated into the into the dielectric sandwich between the two like two electrodes migrates out again, and the sensor comes back to equilibrium. And this can take several hours sometimes. Sure. Okay. There's one other question here regarding about what sensors are available for water-based oils, like in hydraulic. Uh, so, sea, for water-based oils. At the uh, moment, so viscosity, things like that, both viscosity, temperature, maybe kind of, probably not conductivity, but certainly not humidity. But for water, no, the problem, the problem for water based is that for for water glycol glycols is that they are also chemically aggressive and they t tend to wear out the wear out the sensor components pretty quick. Oh, okay. Okay. One thing I noticed too is on your slide, I think it was number twenty six that showed the viscosity change that. Even though it wasn't temperature related, things like that can be very useful to pick up, um, you know, shear stability and problems with the oil shearing down. And, and that's one of the things, certainly in power generation, people forget that when you take a particle sample, that's only indicative of what was happening at that time. And people generally don't run out and take a sample when there's load changes or things like that. And, and that's when you want to know when particles are coming down from the valves and coming down from the equipment. So, yeah, I certainly think a lot more can be done, especially on smart. Uh, differential pressure sensors, you know, on filter elements. Uh, sure, and on all of them. Um, but you know, 
the problem I, I think the problem is lack of lack of due diligence really on, on, on all the sensor sensor companies, not just us. Um, in terms of being able to correlate the laboratory to the real world. Um, and like I said, you know, we, we, we now live in a world that when we send the sensors 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 out, um, people tend to tend to interpret their signal as gospel. Uh, without without really correlating them to to what else is is occurring within the system, or even if the sensor is reading correctly or not. Okay, just as a comment, everyone too. If you have any more questions, I think your email was on the um, notice that was sent out. If they have any more questions, can they send them to you, John? Sure. Okay. And if the email isn't there, if you just send it to uh, Bashad or myself, we can pass it along to John if it's not there. So uh, we got one other question here. Uh, would an online sensor compensate for air bubbles that might be induced by a hydraulic yeah. pump? So well, it, depend, be, it, it sure. depends. It depends in, in, what, in, in which manner. Uh, obviously, for particle counters, no. You'll get an erroneous reading, no question. Um, yeah, for that other things. Yeah, there's something. Pardon? That would then tell you there's something happening. So in, in effect, it is detecting it. Yes, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to hazard a guess as to uh, you really have a very very high very high particulate count and it really corresponds to 24 24 24 because there's a lot of silt ingression or there's a lot of there's a lot of varnish or there, or simply the sensor some stuff has plated out on the sensor or this is all due to air. Yeah, you know this is. This is again, you know, you get to the point of flying blind, and you only you're only dealing with a signal, and this is not sufficient information to be able to to provide an unequivocal answer. Yeah, no, I agree, but it, it could be an indication that something's changed, and then you'd send somebody down to check to see if a pump's cavitating or making noise or just what's happening. Sure, and in some of our growing pains, we even suggested such things that you know this is not really a sensor and a monitor. Uh, or it is a monitor. Yeah? So if some if something changes, go and investigate. But then then you're you're essentially back to square one, right? But you um, you still have to go and investigate. And 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 typically, what do you do then? You typically then take the sample and send it to the lab. So the the function of the sensor is only to alarm you to, that yeah something is weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's good. That, well, that Weird can mean something not good happening, so that could be actually... yeah, sure, no, no, no <laughs> doubt. And, and one of the things, one of the things again, you know, to emphasize that if you link three of them together and something not good is happening on all three, then you really have something. Typical example would be this: you have a water ingress in a in a paper machine lubricating oil, which is very prone. The additives are very prone to hydrolysis, all the sulfonates and so on. So you have a water ingress, so the, the relative humidity goes up, um, and then you have a very rapid hydrolysis occurring, so the particle count goes up. Uh, and, and, and then the oil filter service life goes down, and it goes down along that straight slope, meaning that the caking effect is occurring. So now you have three signals that are telling you the same thing. You have a water ingress, your additives are rapidly hydro hydrolyzing, so yes, you better be prepared to be replacing these filter elements very, very quickly. But at the same time, you better put a dehydrator on your on your paper machine lubricating oil to re remove the water and reduce the risk of hydrolysis and reduce the extent of hydrolysis. Certainly. Okay. There's one more question just came in. Um, which is better, in your opinion, for taking samples, online or offline? I assume by offline they mean a kidney loop system, but I'm not sure. Online is always better. No question, live system. You can take them from the tank, but the tank is not is not going to be or reservoir is not going to give you as as representative situation as what's happening on the system. And actually, taking them from depending on how critical the diagnosis is or. Uh, uh, how severe the issue is, collecting them from several distributed locations, just like installing sensors at several distributed locations, will provide you with mo most information. What's coming to the back to the tank? What's coming out of the tank? 
what's coming out of the filter. You know, all of these can, can give you a different glimpse of what's happening within your system. Okay, the, the person just commented more. The reason is because sometimes bubbles come out online, but if you're doing particle counters, the bubbles would come out anyways by the time you did your particle counting. So I'm not sure. So anyways, it's a bit after 11 o'clock now, although unless there's some question people want to pursue right now, you know, just send John an email and we'll get back to you. So I'd like to sure. thank everybody for attending. We had up to 62 at one time. And John, thank you very much for a very thank interesting Thank you. And just one question, how can I download the presentation? Is it is it going to be available for download? Yes, it's going to be available on our website when Bishad uh, loads it on there. Okay, let me know how, okay, because I'm, I'm interested. Thank you very much, everybody. No, no, no. It was really great, uh, great uh, having having some chat with you, and enjoy the rest of your day or evening, Thank whatever. You. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye. Thank you, John. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>